Okay, we'll begin with uh, some very simple scriptures. First of all, we will consult uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay, just to, we need to shorten the reading so that we don't get lost in talking. We'll do verse 1, then we'll do verse 5. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. There is a call to holiness. You see, the work of priesthood requires so much alignment with the nature of the Holy Spirit. If you are going to work with God, you must understand that you are going to be a victim of God's nature. God's nature is going to judge your actions. God's nature is going to judge your, the way you prosecute your life. Uh, once and again, the Holy Spirit will come when you are so tired, you need sleep, and he will invite you for a time of communion. If you don't understand that uh, you will need to give up something in order for you to align with him, you will always um, resist his advances. There are times when he summons you to come, you know, to see or hear the things, the new decrees that are coming out of heaven. It's going to cost you a lot and uh, to be in perpetual alignment with God. The call that we see in verse number one is a call to alignment. And that call to alignment is a departure from um, agreeing with the ways of the flesh. It, it sometimes is like dying. It's like dying. But you see, as you die to the flesh, you become alive to God. So it's a call to all intercessors. And I want to say this uh, because um, I saw some, some guys back in Nigeria, they like prophesying. Uh, they like prophesying, but they don't like praying. So they are fake. Because the, the, the root of the prophetic ministry is the intercessory ministry. If you hear anybody anywhere, any, in any part of the world, um, emphasizing prophecy without prayer, such a person is out of order. It's a proof that the person has no debt. Because you are going to become efficient in your priesthood before you enter into the prophetic realm. The preoccupation of a prophet is intercession. That's his job description. The, the anointing and the grace to prophesy, the grace to pick things up from the spirit is a result of his culture of intercession. And the demands of God are uncompromising. He doesn't change it because there's a new generation that is on the block. So the Bible says if you see what is going on here, there's a migration towards alignment. It says, wherefore, laying aside all malice. The reason why you're paying this price is because you want to gain alignment with God. I remember some time ago, something happened and I felt my wife was wrong and I said, hey, this is wrong. Oh my God. Then I went to pray and the Lord said, uh, you don't talk to my daughter that way if you want to uh, advance with me. Yeah. So he suggested that I should apologize. It took me three days to. <laughs> took me three days. I, I, I want to believe I'm a spiritual man. I want to believe so. But in order for you to gain alignment, you might not know how strong your flesh is. So you say, laying aside all malice. As easy as and as simple as this statement sounds, you, you might need to fast and ask God for grace in order for you to kill malice. Because Satan wants to contaminate your vessel. He wants to make you a vessel that operates under the influence of anger, hatred, bitterness. And except you find that harmony that can only be actualized in the environment of alignment, your vessel will be so complicated that it will be difficult to occasion the release of the Spirit through your life. He said, we need to migrate. 
Meanwhile, when I found the much needed masculinity in grace to apologize and to say, well, you know, and I did it with uh, a lot of wisdom. <laughs> I found ventilation in my spirit. So every attempt to migrate from the flesh gives you so much ventilation in the spirit that will make you know that this, this was the best thing to do. So there's a call to migration in verse 1. And the reason why this call to migration is without any form of compromise is because he wants to reveal something which is in verse number 5. He said, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This is supposed to be, this is the territorial temple of priesthood that God wants to build in every region. This is a call to priesthood. Oh, do you still remember Peter was the first one that realized that he was a stone. When he captured the revelation of Jesus, he qualified to know who he was in the framework of that which God was building. Oh, you're not with me. Now, 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 that revelation came. Jesus had a secret in his heart that he was not willing to disclose. The last place he did ministry was in the West. And he moved from the West to the East without saying anything. When he got to the east, it was precisely at Caesarea Philippi. That was when he began to administer a questionnaire. And he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? This was the Jesus that was not concerned about what you thought about him. Suddenly, he's trying to administer a questionnaire to gather data. I, I, I stopped and I, I tried to find out why. Then I realized the reason for which he did what he did. Meanwhile, when he had administered the questionnaire the first time, he found out that the personality he was looking for was not somewhere outside. So he reduced the sample space of his administration. And he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? But meanwhile, why the questions? It was because in his communion with his father that day, his father gave an insight into the fact that he had revealed who he is to someone in the crowd. And Jesus said, all right, you don't need to tell me, I'll find out. So he came and initiated this questionnaire system. And when he reduced the scope of the administration of the questionnaire, Peter spoke up. And I believe it took some time before he spoke up. He said, you are the Christ. There were two things about Jesus that he revealed. First of all, was his ministry that was domiciled in the realm of the spirit. You are the Christ. By that statement, he was talking about an administrative position that was domiciled in the spirit that Jesus was ordained to occupy. That was what, it was because he sat in that office in the spirit that the day of Pentecost was occasioned. If you see Peter's explanation for Pentecost, are you with me? Amen. In the book of Acts 2, verse 36, the Bible says, Acts 2, 36, do you, can you put it on, on the screen? This is the summary. He spoke about political things, spoke about cultural things. He spoke about so many historical things. And then he drew the attention of his audience to this statement. This is what happened. Are you there? If you read verse 33, you are going to see that it is the outpouring of the Spirit was occasioned by the fact that Jesus was admitted into an office in the realm of heaven. You don't believe me? All right, since you don't believe me, I'm going to go to the book of Psalms 110 to show you the, pro the prophetic back end of Acts chapter 2. Can we go to Psalms 110? It says, the Lord said unto my Lord, this is in heaven. The Father said unto the Son, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So Jesus was being offered an office, a ministry 
in heaven on, the, on, on his return from satisfying the claims of divine justice, which was his ministry on earth. So when he got back to heaven, he was assigned an office. He was assigned a ministry in heaven. Are you there? So he said, sit down at my right hand. And it will interest you to know that right hand doesn't mean this side. I know you. <laughs> he, he wasn't saying sit this side. Uh, but you see, if you, the, the use of that phrase right hand is, it has a meaning in kingdom context. When, when we say someone is the officer at my right hand in kingdom context, it means it is him that administration has been committed to. Don't worry, I will explain. Okay, so he says, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So the father now was doing two things. First of all, he was offering the son an office, a ministry, all right? And secondly, he was giving the son a promise that I am going to make your enemies bow at your feet. So the, second, the first question is, how does the father intend to achieve that? He says that in verse 2. He said, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. That means the rod of thy strength, which is the Holy Ghost, is going to leave Zion and come into the earth. Are you there? The reason for which he will be dispatched into the earth it is, is because of the promise that he made to the son that you sit in administrative capacity and it will be my business to bring your enemies to bow at your feet. So in implementation, he now releases the Holy Spirit to leave heaven and to go into the earth to become the actor on the stage of the accomplishment of his economy, his plan. Are you there? Yes. And then you will notice that the next verse talks about uh, thy people. Because the Holy Spirit alone cannot accomplish that promise. He will need to partner with men. All right. So thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. He was speaking about the day of Pentecost. I don't have time to build it. But this is the back end of the story of Pentecost. And in the story of Pentecost, Peter operating as an interpreter because people were about to judge what God was doing in a bad light. So Peter had to rise as an interpreter to bring perspective to the things that God was doing. And in his explanation, he came to verse number 33 of Acts chapter 2. So that's the verse I want now. Hey, there. hey, can you give me that verse on the scripture? He said, therefore, being by the right hand of God and exalted. This is Jesus. This is current situation. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. You see, the reason why the Holy Ghost was, was poured out was because Jesus was already exalted. He was sitting in that office. So the Holy Spirit comes down here to make that office efficacious upon the face of the earth. To make that office real. To make that office powerful. Are you there? So there's an administration that Jesus is working out. And the personality that, that brings the reality of that administration happens to be the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is going to partner with you and me. In order for the effect of that administration to affect the territory. It is him that is behind the scene in your spirit that is working. And your yieldedness to him is going to determine if he begins to reclaim the heritage of God that is lost in the land. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. All right. So this is the arrangement. When Jesus in Philip, Caesarea Philippi administered the question and Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ. You are the one destined to be the administrator, to sit at the right hand of God and administer all of his purposes. That's who you are. You are also the son of the living God. So there are two things there, his ministry and his person. I don't have time to talk about the son of the living God. Why? What's the meaning of that? Person. 
But if you want to find that, you can go to the book of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter number um, one. Begin to read from Hebrews chapter one. There's a contrast and a comparison in the book of Hebrews. Um, um, just so that people will not be confused because the believers of those days highly elevated angels. So there was a contrast and a comparison that was done in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 to show the excellency of the Son of God. Are you there? Yes, sir. And, and, and in the eyes of the average Jew, um, uh, Moses was the epitome of the concept of the prophet. He had to do a contrast and a comparison to show that Jesus was greater than Moses. So there are contrasts, there are comparisons to bring people out of the swamp of confusion. To see that there is this personality that has been pedestaled. An administration has been committed into his hands. He's the beauty of heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So in, in the book of um, uh, Hebrews chapter um, 1, verse 1, the Bible says, God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. I'm just trying to explain uh, um, the great confession of Peter. Yes. Are you with me? Yes, has in these last days he has spoken unto us by his son. Mm. You, you, you know, there, there are a lot of terminologies that are used to depict the counsel of God in the Old Testament. You hear things like the judgments of God. You hear things like the testimony of God. You hear things like the laws of God and the statutes of God. And it, it, is, it is, for weak theological students, they take all of these things to, to mean the same thing. But they, they are not quite the same thing. When we say the testimonies of God, what we are saying is, are you there? Yes, sir. What God said by himself about himself. That's the testimony of God. Are you there? Yes. What God said about by himself, about himself. That's the testimony of God. You know the Bible says God who has hundred times and in diverse manners is speak unto the fathers by the prophets. But there, there, is, there is a measure of light that the prophets could not give. And so God has decided to use testimonies in the last days. He will speak unto us by himself, about himself. Are you there? One of the differences between a prophet and one that prophesies, because you can, you, can be, you can have the gift of prophecy and not be a prophet. The prophesier speaks for God. But the prophet will receive revelations of God. God will reveal himself to the prophet. The prophet speaking is based on the fact that he knows God. God is committed to revealing himself to him. So when he begins to speak, you will know that his voice is different. The texture of his speaking is a function of the fact that God is committed to unveiling himself to him. Are you there? Yes. So in the last days, that there's a shift in capacity building. The capacity builder is the Lord himself. Now, since the capacity builder is the Lord himself in the last days, he begins to give us some insight as to who the Son of God is. Number one. Are you there? Yes. I can't see the scripture. Give me the scripture. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke unto the fathers by the prophets in this last day, spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Is the heir, is the one that is in charge of all things. Is the one that God has committed administration to. In order for him to manage things, it is him that is the manager. If you study the book of Revelation, you'll find out that the center of the kingdom of God is the administration of God. And the center of the administration of God is the throne of God. And that's the throne that he was given. Are you with me? So he, he has been made heir over all things. The Bible says by whom God made the worlds. It means that Jesus was 
in the work of creation. If you go to the book of Genesis chapter 2 from verse 5 to 7, you are going to see a personality step out of the quadrant of the Godhead to do some work of modeling. The Bible says, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb before it had grown, for the Lord God, the Lord God is the identity of that person, Jehovah Elohim, and that's the pre-incarnate name of Christ. Jehovah Elohim had not caused it to rain and there was no man to till the ground and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and bred into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. His, his layer of consciousness was on the soul level. Because the project was, let us make man, not create man. They were, and the three members of the Godhead came to that decision, indicative of the fact that the three members of the Godhead would participate in the making of man. The father did the creation in Genesis chapter 1. The son did the modeling of the container in Genesis chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit was supposed to possess him if he had eaten of the tree of life. But that aspect of the project was not done before Satan hijacked the project. Yes, sir. Are you still with me? Yes, sir. The Lord God, he was involved in creation. By him, God made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, I'm, I'm explaining the son, mm. huh? and the express image of God's person. It means Jesus was the definition of God. There was no attribute of God that was obscured in his manifestation. Amen. Even though he changed form and took on the form of man. But there was no attribute that was in the Godhead that was obscured in his manifestation. The Bible calls him the brightness of the glory of God. The Bible calls him the express image of God's person. If you just want to know God through the lens of man, study Jesus. So in Jesus, God is no longer obscured. In the Old Testament, you couldn't walk up to God and say, Hey, God, uh, can I go to Glasgow tomorrow? That was not a possibility. But when Jesus was manifest in the book of John chapter 9, you'll find people went to him and said, who, who sinned that this man was born blind? That was, that was prayer of inquiry. That was why there was no need to fast when Jesus was there. Because if you wanted to conduct inquiry, it was as good as locating where he was and you go to him and say, Who sinned that this man was born blind. And, and he, he will not say, go and come back later. He reaches back into hallowed antiquity and he begins to give you a download. It was, it was not his father's sin. It's not even his sin. But this was done so that the glory of God might be made manifest. What Jesus meant by that is, okay, in the studio when he was created, what's your name, sir? Bright came and he gave him eyes. So he was born with eyes. When that man came, he refused to give him eyes. So he came blind. Because the guy will manifest at the time where Jesus will be physically present in this world. And then Jesus will now give him eyes upon arrival. So it, 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 it was not seen. And if you check the way Jesus occasioned the miracle that gave the guy eyes, that's what he did in the studio. You know, he, he spat on the ground. I don't want to go into that. I don't want to go into that now. I'm just, I'm trying to introduce a personality to you. That personality was revealed by the confession of Peter. And the moment Peter made that confession, every revelation of him you have, you qualify for yourself to be revealed in his agenda. So when, when, when Peter got a revelation of him, he qualified to know who he was in the agenda of God. That was when Jesus changed his name. So you will be called Kepha. You will be called a stone. So that's why it's no wonder that it was Peter that picked the revelation of the fact that we are lively stones. He found out that he was not the only stone. We are lively stones. I know you must have watched some construction take place in England. Uh, where the builders came to put up a house. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit different. Because the stones we are talking about here are precious stones. Have you seen anybody build with diamond, with onyx, with sapphire? Yes. Because, because if you are building with stones, the stones are not the same shape. It's not like brick. It, they are different in shape. 
Every stone is unique in itself. So we are. Your, so your calling, your ordination, your purpose is unique and we are fitting it into that of your husband. And his own calling and purpose, the shape is different. So we are lively stones. Precious stones. Built into a spiritual house. We have different refractive in indices. We have different, different shapes, different sizes, different capacities. But we are built into a house of glory. He said, that's what God wants to do in the spirit. And that's the reason why you need to migrate from malice, from evil speaking, so that you can come into alignment. Because there's a building that God wants to raise in the city of Manchester. Amen. There's a building. The eyes of mortal men will not look upon it, but it is an edifice is destined to be raised in the city. And that place will become the command tower and the control center that determines what will work in Manchester and what will not work in Manchester. So that's what is going on here. See, the Holy Spirit needs to partner with people in order for his purposes to find expression. And so, the Bible says, thy people shall be willing. Oh my. I pray, I pray that you know that he was talking about us. The father was telling the son that you will have a people. Yeah. The father was telling the son that you, you will not just have a people, you will have a willing people. Thy people, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness. Mm. The word holiness there means separation. The beauty of the Holy Ghost that is upon your life will not be visible until you become absolutely separated unto God. According to the scriptures, you can, you, you can be operated by so many softwares. One of them is the flesh. You can run your life on the software of the flesh. You can run your life on the software of sin. Sin can preoccupy you for 90 years. Hallelujah. You can be a victim of beer until old age. Until your liver begins to cry out. It can, keep, it can preoccupy you. So you can run your life on the plane of sin. You can run your life on the plane of the flesh. You can run your life on the, on the plane of self-centeredness. That is the tragedy of the fallen man. He, he, he doesn't do anything except there is something for he, he need for him. Meanwhile, when we look at the example of Jesus, you see a personality that was so empty of self and full of God. That's why it's difficult to understand the prayer of Jesus in the book of John chapter 17. Yes, yes, yes. You need to, it was a picture of his intimacy, his level of, of, of intercourse with his father. It was a picture. He was praying what his father had on his mind. So you, you would tell his level. One of the ways we can measure men in the body of Christ it's through the content of your prayer. What do you pray about? You will know where you are. You will know where you are. He said, thy people shall be willing. You are going to have a willing people. And the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. It's going to possess them. And they will begin to migrate and become more one with each other. All the dichotomies will not work with them. The dichotomies of color of skin, dichotomies of nationality, dichotomies will not work with them. There's going to be a blend of, that can only be supernatural. The, the Holy Spirit will make them more one with each other so that they can become a spiritual temple domiciled in their cities through which legislation, through which intercession can take place and we create earthly permission for heavenly interference. And God will be able to set foot on the platform of our prayers and worship and bring the government that is domiciled in the heavens in the, into the city of Manchester. It's a ye A lively stones. And you are built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And the purpose of this holy priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Underlying sacrifices, that's where I'm going this night. Acceptable to God through Christ. There's an, I need to take you to the book of Hebrews. 
And the reason why I need to do so is because uh, there is a word that most of us feel is an Old Testament word. Uh, unfortunately, um, we find it in the book of Hebrews. I want to introduce you to that word. And then I'll open two scriptures. Two scriptures. And then consolidate the emphasis that is on, on my spirit. And if I have time, I will show you a dossier of the Lord. But that dossier of the Lord is in the scripture. I can read it, but you take it from me. That's thus said the Lord. Amen. In the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 13, Paul begins to give us insight about priesthood, and he uses the mirror of the Leviticus priesthood to uh, give us insight into what priesthood is within the context of the Melchizedek priest dimension. I'll, I'll read from verse 9. I don't have time to do the whole reading because of, I'm, I'm pressed for time. So I'll read from verse 9 and then verse 10 is my emphasis. It says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is, good, for it is a good thing that a heart be established with grace uh, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Mm. Part of what the devil does in order to distract us so that we do not have a temple built with lively stones in every city and every nation is that he sends people to use the Bible to distract us from the center and the circumference, the extent and the limit of divine revelation. And the center and the circumference, the extent and the limit of divine revelation happens to be Christ. Uh, that's, that's the goal of the believer. He wants to satisfy uh, the demands that are coming from that administrative office. The administrative office gives you an allocation of purpose, an allocation of pursuit and destiny. And you are supposed to run your life. The meaning of life is that I am living to fulfill the desire of the Christ. Such, that kind of living strikes a chord with eternity and it is an investment into the realm of eternity. So even though time is measured, that kind of lifestyle will earn you a platform that will never die in the days to come. And that was why Paul said the description of living for a man like Paul was to live Christ. For me to live is Christ. That's his definition of living. The promptings of Christ. The, the, the desires of Christ. I, I, I spend my pilgrimage upon the face of the earth to furnish it, to prosecute it. That is life for me. And every time you strike a chord, with something that was on the heart of God. He releases ventilation into your heart so strong that you will know you're on the right path. And at, and at every point in time where the things you are pursuing do not have the capacity to produce that ventilation, it means you are striking a chord that is measured into time. And time is a lie. The devil wants to ensure that the spiritual house is not built in Manchester, in London. He wants to ensure that that body of priesthood, that will be the basis upon which he has permission to intervene in earthly affairs, will not be available in China, will not be available in India. And so Satan will become the prince and the governor of such nations. But if we, if we can decide that in Manchester, the spiritual house will be built. Oh, he said, I will, I will, I will. He said, he said, I, I forgot in the scripture. Oh. I put my scriptures in, the, in my brain. I, I, I used to be good at it. Maybe I'm, I'm becoming old. Ah, okay, it has come. It's how, it's how we act. Hey, it has gone again. <laughs> ah. 
you need to pray for me. You need to be praying for me sometime. The sacrifices and burnt offerings have been accepted upon my altar and my house among all nations shall be called the house of prayer. So that's, that's something God wants to do among all nations. He wants to have a spiritual house of prayer. And I will bring them. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody prayed for me. I will bring them upon my holy mountain. I will make them joyful. In my house of prayer, their sacrifices, their burnt offerings shall be accepted upon my altar and my house among all nations. The first time Jesus gave a description of how the church should be, he, he, he called the church the house of prayer. Are you with me? But do you realize that the house of the sons of the bond woman is more of a house of prayer than God's house? Because the sons of the bond woman, they will pray if they are sick, they will pray if they are broke, they will pray if they are hungry, they will pray even if they are in prison. But you, the moment the weather, the weather changes, there's a heat wave. It's a heat wave. It's a heat wave. Let me tell you, we live in heat waves in, in, in Nigeria. We, 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 that's where we live. May the Lord give you understanding. So when the temperature changes, you change. You have not yet become a house of prayer. You become a house of prayer when nothing can stop you from fulfilling the requirement of your priesthood. And if we have, oh, are you, are you still with me? When you see a believer that cannot be consistent with God, even, he can't even be a witch. <coughs> witches, witches who are this. <coughs> you need, you need, you need discipline, spiritual discipline to be a witch. They invest in capacity building every night for 80 years. Oh, you, you, oh that's why they teach them how to cast spells. Oh, you don't know. Okay. I, I don't want to say we are online, so I can't say something. I can't say something. I can't say something. You know what? There is a lot of discipline that is associated with becoming a house of prayer. Yes. Every single day. Every single day. I know this in my heart that I'm supposed to be a house of prayer. That there are some gemstones. I, I might be Jasper and you are Onyx and I don't have time to show you, show you, because Jasper talks about the appearance of God. Every precious stone has what it stands for, what it does. You, you might find out that on some people's ministry, the presence of God is stronger than others. It is because of the shape, the kind of stone that they are. That's what determines their spiritual texture and the possibilities that are bound in their deliverables. But the devil will do everything to ensure that you are not a house of prayer. He can change the weather to ensure that you, you don't feel your measure that day. And there is a gap. There is, there is the hedge. The hedge has, is broken somewhere because you were lost in the metrics. And a serpent can find the expression. The spirit of torment can still prosper. But if we hold our lines, hold our lines, a time will come when you realize that the things that you are afraid of are actually afraid of you. You see, our job description is to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Somebody is talking to me from the congregation. He said, but I've been praying and this situation has prospered. <laughs> Sometimes your agreement to pray now enlists you on a spiritual journey. If you are traveling to Glasgow from Manchester and your fuel finishes, you you don't get discouraged. You just drive into a station. And you feel it all. And you continue your journey. Now let me tell you something. You need to pay a price in order to arrive where your solution is. But it is not a change of program. It is consistency. There were prayers I prayed. It took 10 years before I saw the manifestation. Oh. I pray you leave a legacy of prayer for your children.
the legacy of prayer. We got a land somewhere to build our own space, a small piece of land. Part of what was used to buy the land was the money I saved for my wedding. I saved money for my wedding. And for those of you that know the Nigerian Naira, I was earning 60,000 Naira. Guess what? I saved one million. So yeah, that, that, he understands it. It will take a miracle for you to do that. I saved one million. And I don't need to tell you how long it took for me to do that, to, to save that kind of money. And the moment I finished saving it, we were in a prayer meeting and I was excited. So I, I just worship. I say, Jesus, hallelujah. And as I was lost in the worship, he said, gather that money and give me. I said, no. <laughs> but I had already heard it. Now, I, I, and I asked God, I said, were you not there when I started saving it? If, if you wanted me to give you, you would have said, be giving me this amount so that I'll be saving with you. I'll, and I'll not have to go through the heartbreak of saving. You know, I told you it's like dying. We don't know that God is spirit. What, what, what a spirit desires is different from what mortals desire. And I need to show you some things from the Bible that what can catch the attention of a spirit being is called sacrifice. That's the currency of transaction with spirits. It's called what? Do you realize that we are a spiritual house so that we can offer up spiritual what? You got that. Let me give you some insight. Um, come with me to the book of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. No time. I was supposed to begin to read from verse 8, but I don't have time for that. You will see the three mighty men and the exploits that they carried out. And meanwhile, these were people that were destitute. They were tired of life, they were in despair, they were broke, and they joined themselves to David, and David became a captain over them. And when the Davidic anointing began to manifest, it changed champions, it changed charlatans, and made them <laughs> champions. Uh, Hallelujah. Amen. Are you from South Africa? Or yeah. from, okay, so you understand, you understand that. Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I spoke a parable that only a South African can understand. So, charlatans were changed to champions. And then their exploits were written. And I don't have time to, because if I had read that, you will see they, that their training was thorough. Now, so David had three mighty chiefs, and uh, this is the only account in the entire Bible where the three chiefs collaborated together to accomplish something. And that is in 2 Samuel chapter 23 from verse 15. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. This is David. He grew up in Bethlehem. That's his village. But because of wars and political concessions, his village was now a territory where the garrison of the Philistines camped. So he could no longer access the well that he used to drink from when he was a child. And as he was, he was passing through the place with his militia, he said, oh, that one will give me drink from the well 
of Bethlehem. That was not exactly like a war charge. It was just a long game. Now these guys, it takes five years to raise a, a legionnaire, one that can use the sword and shield very effectively. It takes five years. All right? But, but it took 12 years. David was running in the cave at Dulam. He built his fortress there and he was there for 12 years. So the guys that he was training had become experts and they were looking for opportunities to show their skill. There was no battle in sight and they trained them for 12 years. So they took a longing to be a, a war crowd. That's how Jesus is saying, oh, that one will give me the souls of, of Manchester. And he said longing. But true warriors will hear a battle cry in that longing. Oh, these guys, they went down to Bethlehem. And it was a garrison. A garrison is the same as a legion. That's from 2,000 to 12,000 soldiers. Camped in one place. And three guys say they want to get water. Meanwhile, when one of the guys wants to draw water out of the well, they, they are one man down. How did they do that? And they came back with the water. But you see, you must understand that David was a disciple of Samuel. It was Samuel that taught him prophetic things. It was Samuel that taught him priestly things. So there were some things that some other kings tried to do. They lost their kingdom. Have you heard of uh, Uzziah? He went into the temple to offer sacrifice. He trespassed his jurisdiction and he was struck with lepro leprosy. Have you heard of Saul? He offered sacrifice so that uh, he can make petitions to the Lord concerning the army of Israel and he lost his kingdom. But David operated successfully as a priest and a prophet and there was no challenge. It was because he had the training. Part of the things that Samuel taught David is what manifested in this scripture. Are you with me? Yes. Now this is what David said when he poured out that water as a libation. He said, and he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. It's not this. He's talking about the water. The blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives, therefore, he would not drink it. He had gotten some insight into priesthood. And his value for that water. A, a, a carnal person will see water. But a priest will see that that water has the value of the sacrifice that was put in to acquire it. So he saw it as blood. And only God can take blood. So he gave, he poured it out. As a libation unto the world. Can you see it? Spiritual understanding. It means God will only take sacrifice. If what you are doing is convenient, it doesn't strike any chord in eternity. You are operating according to the way of man. But if you want to reach God, it's going to cost you something. Do you remember when David made an error of numbering Israel and God had said, that Israel is going to be without number. They are going to be like the sand on the seashore. They are going to be like the stars of heaven. These are two strands of the same lineage. The sand on the seashore is talking about physical Israel. The stars of heaven is talking about you and me that became sons and daughters of Abraham because we followed the similitude of his faith in contacting God and walking with God. Are you there? Yes. So no man can count. Even the scientists have not been able to count the stars. He said, that's how my sons and daughters will be across the generations. No man can count the Jews. They are scattered everywhere. That's how their sons and daughters will be across the generations. So there's no need for you to conduct a census. And suddenly, David was moved to pride. It was a principality that moved his heart and he began to number Israel. And when he did that, he had committed an abomination. But he didn't know the depth of pain he brought to the heart of God. So the prophet came to him and gave him three judgments that will come upon the territory. 
But it came to pass that when the plague began to leak up people in the territory because of the error of the king. The thing about the error of a king is that his error will affect the whole estate, the whole land. The prophet had to run to him and told him where to offer a sacrifice. He should offer a sacrifice in the field of Arauna, the, Je the Jebusite. And when David came there, and Arauna was, began to shiver. Hey, why are you here? So I have come to sacrifice unto the Lord. He said, take anything you want to know. I will not offer unto the Lord that which cost me nothing. That is the way of priesthood. It must be what? A sacrifice. Oh, so you come back from work and you're tired. All you want to do is just to take beans and fall on the bed. Then the Holy Spirit will whisper, I am here. You know why? In that your tiredness, if you choose him, you have sacrificed. He will give you the strength to, to go beyond the weakness of your flesh. He will, su he will supply that. He will do all of that. But he wants you to have a heart that is willing to sacrifice. That's a heart that pedestals him and elevates him over and above any other thing in your life. If you are going to operate that way, then a spiritual house will be built in the land. And no matter how many devils are dispatched into the territory, they will be immobilized by the fact that there's a spiritual house that is built in the territory. He said, we are lively stones. And so there is, there is a spiritual exercise that is due for the onyx, for those that are in the similitude of the onyx. Eh? The shape of your spiritual requirement is different from the next person. Maybe that brother there, his grandfather was the one that translated the Bible into their native dialect. And because of that, he enjoys some leverage of mercy because of the labor of his grandfather and the labor of his father. And so he might, in the night, he might take coffee and yogurt and speak in tongues for 35 minutes, and it will be sufficient preservative for him. But you, your grandfather sold slaves in Africa. And was the chief ten of abomination. There is a compatibility. Uh, okay. Uh, let me stop, let me stop. Some, somebody's so offended. You will need to have a spiritual tank of prayer to enjoy the same liberty that that brother will let. I tell you this by experience. Yeah. What you need to do to keep afloat is dependent on your shape. The kind of stone that you are. So he brings stones together. That means he makes us more one with each other. Uh, that's how we connected, me and James. Supernatural. Because he wanted to build something, so he brought two stones together to form a pathway. He mixes stones, precious stones. They have different textures, different specifications, different refractive indices, different, all different. They bend and light in different ways. And so the anointing that is going to come upon your life will give you illumination in a way that is unique to you. Because the way you handle light as a precious stone is going to be different. Just imagine that these precious stones are built up together. There's a synergy. There's a culture of prayer in the territory that is set up. And then the edifice of God begins to grow. The reason why Jesus made all those statements in Caesarea Philippi was because the tetrarch was changed. Philip became the governor of Caesarea. And Philip happens to be a civil engineer. And when he came, became governor of the province, he began to give the province a facelift. So if, if you come to uh, Caesarea at that time, you'll see blocks, you'll see cement bags, you'll see iron rods, everything that depicts building. You'll see paint buckets. It was in that environment that Jesus said, Thou art Kepha, and upon this rock, I will build my church. You see, Jesus is an object teacher. The environment will have to speak what he wants to speak. 
before he will speak. Like the woman that was at the well in the book of John chapter 4, Jesus wanted to dig a well. That's why he came to that location. And the well he wanted to dig was in men, in that woman. So when he succeeded, I don't want to tell you the story of how he dug that well. Because when Jesus showed up, the woman, the woman, he asked the woman for water. And the woman said, how is it that you being a Jew is asking a woman of Samaria for water? Because those days, Jews and Samaritans, they don't have dealings. And then Jesus said, well, if you had known the gift of God, and he who it is that speaks with you, you, have, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. It means even though you, I'm asking you for water, you are the one that actually needs living water. Hmm. The old man said, eh, this water that you claim to have, you don't even have a bucket to draw it out. How do you intend to um, give me this uh, water? Meanwhile, at first he said, you are a Jew. When he discovered that Jesus said, I have something to give you, he now addressed him properly. He said, sir, can you see that there's the, the, the process of digging is, 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 is advancing from Jew to sir. Mm. So Jesus now said, uh, where is your husband? He said, well, I have no husband. Oh, Jesus said, all right. I have known you to be a great liar, but this time you spoke the, the truth. <laughs> You, you became decent today. You see, the truth is that you have been with five husbands and then you just moved into one man's house and say, you don't want to put yourself on the spotlight anymore. So you just moved in. You've had six husbands, sorry. And the man you are with now, is it six or five? And five husbands. And the man that you are with now is not your husband. And then Jesus became the seventh man. So he said, where's your husband? Say, no, I don't have any. He said, all right. Um, you've been with five of them. Uh, the one you're with now, you moved in, in the night. And he's not your husband. The woman changed the salutation again and said, it seems you are a prophet. So from, from Jew to what? To Sir. Now we are at prophet. But prophet is not good enough. Because the people that identify Jesus as a prophet are not yet saved. Uh, may the Lord give you understanding. They were able to arrive, he was able to arrive at prophet. Now she now said, okay, there's an ancient confusion among our people. Our ancestors said that we worship God on this mountain. But you Jews say, it's in Jerusalem that he must be worshipped. And Jesus said, the time has come. And now it's, it, the location factor will no longer be the factor. Where the true worshippers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Ah! The woman said, you have taken me beyond the syllabus. It's only when Messiah comes that we will know these kind of things. He said, he that speaketh to you, I am he. So, from from Jew to Sar to prophet, and then she arrived at Messiah. So the well was dug. They struck the fountain head. And that was what she used to water the entire city. <laughs> Jesus is an object teacher. He needs the environment to look like what he wants to say before he begins to say it. So he brought them to Caesarea, where there was construction. He said, I'm also involved in construction work. Mm. But what I'm here to build is not with block and stone. It's not with cement bags. It's a spiritual structure. A spiritual house. It's a territorial priesthood that will release the hand of God into nations. That's what I came to build. Because my house among all nations shall be the house of prayer. And I will bring them upon my holy mountain and make them joyful upon my house of prayer. Their sacrifices, their burnt offerings shall be accepted upon my altar. And my house among all nations shall be the house of prayer. 
You know, I said I will prophesy in the words of a scripture in the book of Psalms 50 verse 5. Can you give me Psalms 50 verse 5? That's the dossier of the Lord for tonight. If we get the dossier of the Lord for tonight, then we will, we will pray for a moment. Oh my God. Verse 5. He said, Gather my sins together unto me. This son, thus said the Lord. Gather my sins together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The way of priesthood is a way of sacrifice. That's the way of priesthood. Sometimes you need to let food go. Food go. So that you can travel in the spirit. Sometimes he will put a great demand upon you. To give out some pounds. These this pounds already are located for something on your master plan. You have planned your life out for 13 years. And every slot of pound that will lead to the promised land has been apportioned. And then he shows up and says, I want to disorganize this plan. Can you take all the pounds and create a platform for my kingdom to advance? And the moment you obey, he takes care of your master plan. It takes you beyond your plan. It takes you by the wind of his own plan. He said, gather my sins together. The way of priesthood will require sacrifice. And if you are not ready for sacrifice, you cannot bring down that mountain. You cannot bring down that mountain. So tonight, I came to tell you a story. It will be, it, it will, it will be heartbreaking, so I won't tell you. If I, I don't know what happened and what transaction took place in my family. But when people arrive at the age of 21, something terrible happens to them. It's a sickness. Strange things at 21. And I was in the university when I was 20. So, I was headed for the prayer room. I forgot it was my birthday. I was two minutes to my birthday. I was a bit late for the prayers because the prayers begin from 12 midnight to 1 a.m. I was still in transit when I saw a being in form of a bed and all, it appeared and he wanted to sit on my head. I know you will not believe this. He said, oh, this African boy has come again with his stories. <laughs> So I, uh, I wanted to eat the bed. The bed just went back. It didn't fly back. It went back. So I knew I was in trouble. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me that this is a night you cannot afford to fear. When you fear today, you die today. So I closed my eyes and began to, spoke to, I began to speak in tongues. And I spoke tongues in capital letters. <laughs> in capital letters. After 15 minutes of speaking in tongues, I opened my eyes and saw that the bird had lost a wing. A, a wing was broken. This thing is, is effective. It ran away and went into the bush. Three days later, I was told that a relative of mine woke up, came out, stood by the door, fell, and died. And peace reigned. The turbulence ceased. Unfortunately for the warlock that was entering into that bed, using that bed as a cover, I had found prayer before they visited me. Mm, I found prayer. I learned how to pray in tongues and then I learned how to pray in tongues in capital letter. When that happened, I realized that we can actually make Satan go backward. That was where my confidence came from. Huh? You can go backward. Meanwhile, mm, no, no need to. No need to trouble me. That 
sin I came against, according to the tradition, if you drink water, you can't defeat it. If you step on the ground with your bare foot ever, it will appear to you. So that means the, the antidote is that don't drink water and don't walk barefooted. Always have a socks on. The moment you step on the ground, it will, it will trace you, your location. Anywhere you are in the world. There's water in Coke. There's water in Smoothie. There's water in Fanta. So how do you live, survive without taking water? I am alive today because that witchcraft doesn't have ultimate power. Yeah. Are you with me? We set up prayer. The moment I got married, I told my wife, the reason why it is you is because me and you, we set up prayer. Yes, that's what we do. So we set up prayer. We set up prayer. We set up prayer. The resistance broke. We set up prayer. Manipulation ceased. Then we now said, okay, let us extend the scope of our prayer so that other people can be free. So as I'm talking to you now, all over in Nigeria and some nations in Africa, there are people releasing prayer so that we can hit the nail at the head. I'm standing on prayer. That prayer we started has become a movement. It has become a movement. A movement that has gone beyond Nigeria. A movement. Watch and see the shackles and the chains that have been used to tie Nigeria down. You will watch it. It will break. You will see it now. You see. Prayer. He said, I will bring them upon my holy mountain. I will make them joyful upon my house of prayer. For their sacrifices, their burnt offerings. It shall be accepted upon my altar. And my house. The description of my house among all nations is that it will be a house. Rise on your feet. That's what you are. You are a house of prayer. And so you are the strategy that God has put in place in your family to ensure that Satan does not rule. If you fulfill your calling as a house of prayer, you will bring down mighty things. Your sacrifices and burnt offerings shall be accepted upon my altar and my house. Among all nations shall be the house of prayer. First of all, I want you to accept the calling. Can you accept that calling? He has called us. He has condemned us to prayer. Accept the sentence. I say, Lord, I accept the calling to be your house of prayer. I accept the calling to raise an altar on behalf of my family. I accept the calling to be your house of prayer. Can you tell the Lord that? Tell him that. Tell him that. I accept it. I accept it. So grant that the grace that will galvanize me to function comes upon my life. We have the ability to change things. To change things to prayer. God is calling you 